<laughs> there we go. All right, if we get everybody to uh, mute yourself, that would be lovely. Thank you so much for my introduction. I have been with the plants. I don't even remember a time of my life of not being with herbs. I was raised on a farm, a small farm outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. So if the Southern accent gets a little thick, put it in there and you, I will reiterate some of the words that I say. I'm very excited. This is like my life force to, study, to really share stories of indigenous cultures. Oh, we have somebody from the Queen City. Yes. Um, and definitely the stories of my people. It's Black History Month. For me, Black History Month is 365 days out of the year. This is primarily what I teach. It was very important for me to write this book, not only to encourage all of you to be the culture bearers and storytellers of your own traditions and your own families, but to share a, a perspective of herbalism that is often left out. We get so much into the clinical world that we really forget about using the plants for 100% of what they're here for. And I've been, the plants have taken me on so many journeys inward and throughout the world to really study how indigenous cultures really connect to plants and really connect to healing and helping their clients holistically. And a lot of times we think holistically is what we eat, what plants we take and what kind of regimen we can put them on. So at the end of this, I really hope that you are really inspired to look at the full person, body, mind and spirit and bring about that alchemy of change, which I think is so much missing in Western medicine and is a beautiful thing to really see a person for all of them parts. I've been, I worked five years in medical alongside a, a physician's assistant. My journey started as esthetician, so skincare and technical things. And then it I just think we could. I just reached all the way here to herbalism. Oh. So I really found that you would see people who were eating well, who were, you know, their spirit was off. They were depressed. They had grief. They had all these things and then they weren't healthy and things weren't happening. Then I saw people who were the other way around. So it really is the synergy that has been really taught to me so much by my own people. So I'm going to leave some time for some questions and some answers. So if you have anything or if there's just something burning in your soul, I am not opposed to the question coming up. If I can ask Ryan to, you know, beam it in if I get really started. Um, to bring that up or put it in the chat and we can address it later. So my journey with this book has been very fascinating. I started teaching a class about five years ago about women of the South, herbalists and healers. And so when I was approached by my publisher to do this book, I was really ready, but they're like, yeah, we want you to do it in six months, which is a lot. So, but luckily I had a lot of research. So we're going to dive in and I'm going to walk you through this. And while you're sitting here and listening to me on your lunch break, there's one exercise I really love to have people do on their own. And I know that you all are like cooking one of my recipes, which makes me excited. Please take a lot of pictures and have them shared with me. Um, you are not an accident. And your ancestors, many of your ancestors across all spectrums, had herbalists or you wouldn't be here. So that is one thing that I love to instill in people. It's not an accident that you chose this pathway. You chose to go to school for this. It's an ancestor that was way far back that's really speaking to you. So I really love to ask people this one question and jot it so you all can talk about it You know, while you're cooking and share your stories with people. What is the first plant that you remember taking as a child? What dish or family meal do you also remember eating? And what is that journey with you? I think it's important as you begin to go practice, like all of you, I think, are in different phases of this program. Um, it's really important sometimes because you get in the world and you're like, oh, I'm so new. And really, you're not. You've been this. You've had a whole lifetime of things that have happened to align you to this very moment right here. 
And so I really want you to start thinking about it so you're not like, I'm a new practitioner. You are newer to this part, but you're not newer to the plant world. And you're not new to like the traditions that are in your own family. So that would be very beautiful. Someone said rosemary, lemon and garlic. I love that. I love that. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start telling you a little bit about the book and show you some really pivotal people in here. And also we're going to talk about some of the plants that they used as well. And please be gentle with me. I'm not a very technical person. So I've been trying to Uh, can you see it? I'm on mute. Uh, not yet. Okay, hold on one second. Jackie, you're not on mute. All righty. Screen share. There you go. Can you see it now? Yes. yes thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yay. So this is my beautiful book, African-American Herbalism. I really wanted this to be a very approachable book with people who are beginning, middle, or even novices in this whole field. And as you can see from the front, it talks, there's very many traditions and very much fo many, uh, folkloric stories about how when people were enslaved from Africa, they braided seeds in their hair. Uh, some people dispute that, but others, <laughs> you know, are really adamant about that. But what we did is when you think about it and think about what happened, you can't talk about African-American herbalism without the transatlantic slave trade. So even before that time, we were in ancient Egypt, the Embrus Papyrus, which is one of the most detailed ancient medical texts that there is, had stories of surgeries, had stories of plant medicine that were used how to heal broken bones, how sound healing was very important. And there were actually temples that were designed, like the pyramids that were designed, made of quartz crystal, where the client would actually stand on a certain pitched slab that was made of quartz. They would choose, so being actively participating in their own healing through their own intuition, they would choose one of the things to stand on while the, the sounding underneath the physician would diagnose and treat with sound. So it's very fascinating. I also wrote, you know, there's been a lot of research lately. I think Harvard Medical was the one that used sound frequencies to rebuild heart muscles. So it's very fascinating how we see ancient traditions still in modern texts. So we're in ancient Egypt, but thinking about Africa as a continent and what happened when people were forced, but also uh, my people were travelers. They have been traveling and meeting other cultures even before the times of slavery. So when you think about all those traditions, all of the knowledges that's in people's minds, into the United States in various positions, bringing and weaving with the indigenous people of this country and being able to adapt because of their connection to the plants. Like how they just inertly, uh, people have been so inertly engulfed in being a part of how the world works with the elements, how we are connected with nature. It created a whole unique form of herbalism. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Afrolachin is a term that's used in the South. Um, Afrolacha focuses on cultural uh, contributions of African American writers and musicians. I also like to talk about healers and herbalists as well. Uh, you can also see by this slide, this is the Blue Ridge Mountains. I used to live in Asheville, North Carolina. So this is like one of my herb walks on here and that's goldenrod. That's a picture that, of goldenrod there. So the term Afrolachian is the black Appalachian experience is what I focus most of my stories on, things throughout the South, throughout the Appalachian mountains. And the, the term was coined by Kentucky-based writer, Frank X. Walker. 
So this says Afrolasha cannot be located on a map, yet it manifests in the writer's words, the sounds of musicians, visual arts, and creative networks. As I said before, I like to add healers and herbalists. We continue to build. I seek out the makers and truth tellers. I vow to honor the messy, bittersweet contrast of my home's region and historic challenges and the courageous accomplishments of artists, activists, and residents who want a better future. We'll talk about some of those today. Lucretia, I, I did just want to let you know, um, we're not seeing the change in your slides. Oh, really? We're still seeing the first slide. OK, I don't know why. Let's see. So you can't see the second or third one? Um, no, we're just seeing the first slide. Let's go out of here. Can you see that now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So you can see this slide pretty well, this one. So this is Emma Dupree. She's one of the first ones. Can you see it now? Yes. Perfect, thank you. So these are not in order. These are in the order of which I found these people in my research. So I love to keep it in that. So Emma Dupree is one of the first women we're going to talk about today. They called her little medicine thing. She was born in July uh, 4th of 1897, and then she died and became an ancestor, as we like to call it, March 12th in 96. So she was born North Carolina native. Uh, a lot of times these women who were traditional herbalists and healers were called granny women. And if she was a midwife, it'd be a granny midwife. So that's one thing that in the South that we adopted. So Emma was definitely in Fountain, North Carolina, the most pivotal herbalist in their, in their history. Emma saw all types of people, didn't matter what race you were, didn't matter who you know your family was, if you could pay, if you could not pay. Emma, when she started, um, can you see the next slide? Thank you. Um, Emma, when she started herbalism, she was about a, a young child. And they would always say that Emma, they're like, what's that little medicine thing doing? And she would be on the ground, you know, looking for plants, putting things in her apron, putting things in her pockets. And she would, she always said that God taught her the plants. She never had traditional training until much later in her life where she actually did go and apprentice with doctors and she actually taught the doctors different things about herbs and the plants as well as they taught her a lot of things about how the body worked. There's a beautiful uh, documentary that you can see that they actually filmed Emma. It was a few years before she died. It's called Little Medicine Thing. Uh, about Emma Dupree. So they actually documented walking with her in her garden and, you know, learning from her. And they actually, in her, in the town of which she lived, they actually have an Emma Dupree day, which is really beautiful as well. Uh, Emma is very inspirational to me because as a child, I just kind of knew what the plants did. It's like some herbalists, like they just tell me, which is really sounds, you know, odd, I'm sure to some of you. But when I read about Emma's story, I really found that there were other people who were much like me. And I just got, was in Haiti last year and I was studying with an, an herbalist, an elder in the community up on a mountain. She brought me all these beautiful plants and Nana's in her 80 probably, nobody really knows. And I asked her the same question. I was like, how did you learn about the plants? And she said, through my dreams. And, you know, in her dream world, the plants would come to her and they would say, oh, this is used for this and this is used for that. And then also later in her years, she also interned with the doctor and did a run errands and also taught them herbal medicine. So I see that it's so ingrained in our in my people, this whole knowledge of what sometimes we say the ancestors coming through and teaching you things. I learned that so much in gardening because I would kill fake plants, but I come from farmers. So I just remember sitting being frustrated in my garden, 
sitting there going, ah, oh, you guys have to help me. And from then I could hear like certain things saying, you know, dig this deeper, move this here, water this there. And so that became a very uh, important part is really understanding my ancestral connection to plants. So we're gonna change. Um, I think the slide is stuck again. I don't know what is going on with this thing. So there we go. We can see the photo slide now. Okay. So one thing that's really important is our next one is Mary Hayden. We're going to jump back a little bit. Mary Hayden is very special to me because she is in the Asheville area. Uh, born in 1858. She died in January 18, 1956 in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Do you all know where Asheville is? Black Mountain is just right outside of there. Mary Hayden was what you call a granny midwife. She was a midwife to the whole mountain. And midwives had such a pivotal role. They were doctors. They were psychiatrists. They were psychologists. They really were a part of the family structure and really trying to unite communities through that. Uh, she learned midwifery skills from her mother who served as a midwife in a young age, who was sold to the step plantation in Alabama when she was 13. So Mary also <laughs> was, she learned it was a family thing that they passed down amongst people. And she also learned the plants. I got really excited um, just to kind of preface this is like healthcare was virtually inaccessible to people of color in her time. So these granny midwives were really important because the first hospital for the black community, as you see in this one slide, wasn't until 1927. It was 15 miles outside of Asheville. It had very deplorable, really run down. And even if you could get there, how are you gonna pay for it? So the granny midwives were really important to the, the survival of these country backwoods, you know, communities. One beautiful thing that I loved about her is that no matter what race you were, she was always there for you. Um, she, it was really interesting for me during COVID, I got to meet and talk to her great granddaughter. So this is who you see, Mary Othello Burnett. So we got to share a lot of really great stories about her great grandmother. And that also has a book, The Leisure of Black Walnut Trees, Growing Up Black in Southern Appalachia. That's her, that's Mary's book. So be a beautiful woman. We would talk about some of the plants that she would use, uh, ground ivy being one of them and uh, tansy being another one. Ground ivy is like the bane of my existence. I don't know if all you garden and like when you're weeding ground ivy, yeah, I saw one hand there. So I was like, you know, I'm doing these intensive in my gardens and even in my herbal internships because I always love to see different people's perspectives. I was like, ground ivy, you got to tell me something. What are you good for? And it, come to find out, it's got tons of really good uses. Tinnitus in the ear is one of them. But what I found interesting with these women, especially in these rural areas, is they would use these medicines for things that now science, it makes no sense. Like, well, it makes no sense. So that became a very important plant for her because it was very prolific. So, you know, even like tansy using that for people to go to sleep and like relax um, and ground ivy for so many different things as like boosting the immune system. She talked about that. And when we would discuss plants, she would get such a beautiful glow about her remembering her grandmother and her great grandmother. She said her sister spent more time with her than she did walking around and learning the plants. And she hates that she didn't get as much of that knowledge from her, but she really would spend so much of her time, you know, foraging. And during the Spanish flu epidemic, Miss um, Mary Hayden, we'll get her little picture there. That's who she is, the elder lady that's in the, the picture. She looks very uh, native also in her features. So she was part native, part black. 
and really blended the two cultures together. They have this one story that she was going over the mountain to deliver a baby. So she had her lantern and her little knapsack and she was like going. So she got paid in a ham. And during her walk back home, a catamount, which is huge mountain lion, smelled the ham. So it started coming for her during the middle of the night. So she's like running so quickly to get back home and just basically drops this ham and just, you know, to let the cat have the ham. So if you imagine these huge mountains and just like these women who would climb over them, it didn't matter if you didn't pay for the last baby being born, she was always there completely pivotal for anybody in the environment. Mary Hayden was also very much known. She was probably the first uh, black midwife that is on record. So if you look her up, she's actually listed on record there. And during the 1930s, they started trying to ban a lay mid midwifery. Doctors were not making the money because these granny midwives, you know, people are going to trust you know, Granny Mary over this doctor and like this coat that's there. But the wonderful thing about her, she was very much an activist. So she would go to, you know, these resources, the hospital, she would gather sanitary supplies and disperse them in the midwife community. And so she really was really pivotal, a liaison between the two worlds. So I find that very fascinating and I very much commend and very excited about sharing that information about her. So she was very much about trying to unite the two worlds together. We're also gonna talk about another one of my favorite ones, Miss Henrietta Phelps Jeffries. Henrietta was from Caswell County. You know, her, she was born in 1857, died in, in 1926. She called herself, and you actually see this on the census, a doctress. That was her title. I was like, you go ahead, Miss Henrietta Jeffries. Um, I find she was very fascinating. Another pivotal cornerstone of the community. She birthed babies no matter what race they were. She was always, always up and helping other people, and it didn't matter. She was another one of those bridges. The one interesting fact about Miss Henrietta, even after they banned midwifery, you know, and started, they caught, she was arrested and put on trial for practicing medicine without a license. At that time, it was punishable by death. So a jury of 12 white males found her guilty, but the judge, who a lot of people believe she was also his mother, his, he, his baby catcher, which is sometimes the phrase that we use in the South, um, he overturned it. And so I think that that's one of the fascinating things. He asked everybody in the courtroom, the whole community came to stand to her. It was full of people that she had birthed their babies, birthed them. And he asked everybody to stand if you had been birthed, you know, by Miss Henrietta. And most of the court stood up. And so he, you know, questioned her you know, about will you continue to like to give, you know, tell people to take remedies? And she's like, yeah, pretty much. And he's like, okay, maybe you just suggest that people, we're going to split the difference. And so he overturned her uh, conviction and she was able to still go out and be able to birth children and do the medicine work. She was just diehard. This is what I do for the people. So I find it very fascinating how strong these women were at different parts of their lives. And so Henrietta is one of my favorites as well. Her and Emma Dupree and Mary Hayden, I feel like they were three very pivotal people um, to be in herbalism today. So I want to spend some time talking about Southern folk medicine, plants and food remedies. I think it's very, um, our soul food, whenever, you know, the, that was something created in the South and something that was really Black people and African Americans really, we created this food that was so deep in our, that it touched the soul, this imaginary thing that we all have. So the cooking became part of the ceremony. 
you know, from the boiling of the water to the placing of the black eyed peas in the water to adding in the plant medicine, that became the ceremony to singing the songs, doing this form of sound healing, you know, with the food. And so I'm really big on when you make your plant medicine or cooking your food, have a playlist that reminds you of your ancestors, that reminds you of something that brings joy that you can also be listening to and dancing and like putting that energy in your food as well. So the first plant we come to is mullein. How many of you heard of mullein? Mullein is such a beautiful, especially now during you know the great pause that we all call COVID. Um, what's fascinating also to me is that the earth will supply plants that you need for your own healing. About two months before COVID happened, I'm on my porch in my old garden and I had this mullein plant growing in a pot that was for something else. And I was like, oh, okay, so what's about to happen? You know, I'm talking to this plant on my porch. I have no mullein anywhere in my yard, no mullein seeds, no mullein, nothing. And so I'm looking at this plant growing and I'm like, okay, I guess you'll tell me later. And then two months later, COVID hit. So we know that mullein was used for coughs and respiratory issues. Emma had a really interesting connection to mullein also. She would use the leaves for like swollen legs, swollen ankles. She would even put, you know, mullein leaves on people's heads if they had headaches. And if you've ever put a mullein leaf on yourself, it really causes a lot of circulation. Your skin will get really red around there and sometimes you can see the imprint of the leaf. So I was like, okay, I see that. I see where we can expand our consciousness of this plant. A lot of times it was smoked. It was put into a, a smoking blend. A lot of times with life everlasting or rabbit tobacco is what they call it in the South. I don't know. Uh, life everlasting is a very important plant to the Gullah Geechee people. And that's where I really started hearing about it. And then like, you know, going on these plant walks with them and seeing where it was grown. So very good also for the respiratory system. A lot of times in tea, going back to the smoking, it seems counterintuitive to like have a respiratory issue, but then also add in a smoking blend. But, you know, that is one way that I actually really do use mullein. I blend it with like a little peppermint some of the rabbit tobacco, the life everlasting. Um, I'm very much lucky that I get gifted pure tobacco. So I put a little bit into that as well and some lobelia. So I'll make like a little smoking blend that's there. Also, we talked about used in teas. And then sometimes I actually do put it in if I'm making my bone broth um, and I'm having respiratory issues. I will actually infuse some of that plant into my bone broth as well for like a small batch of that. Uh, cooking with plants is very much a part of our history. I definitely saw that even more reiterated when I was in Haiti. You know, Moringa is the big tea. It's a Moringa, Moringa, Moringa. And like, they're like, oh, you drink the tea? That's cute. We've made three dishes with it today. And so in Haiti, they're like leaves is what they call it, rice and leaves, beans and leaves, corn and leaves. So they're putting all this plant medicine into their food. So that's one way I like to also with my bone broth, if I'm working a specific formula for respiratory issues, I will add in some of the respiratory herbs when cooking the bone broth as well. And then sometimes seasoning blends based on certain issues. Our next one, elderberry. Everybody has heard of elderberry. It's definitely, it's like during COVID, it's sold out. Like people who weren't even with plants were like, I'm gonna buy all the elderberry and it was hard to find. So used for coughs, colds, flus, bronchitis. We know it as an immune stimulant and antiviral. Here in New Orleans, elderberry grows everywhere. It is the most prolific plant I have seen. Old abandoned lots tons of elderberry trees. I guess because we're below sea level, because up north in North Carolina, it was more near rocky, watery 
situations, but here it's everywhere, every neighborhood. You should see my harvest from this year. I have like gallon Ziploc baggies from running through everybody's neighborhood, collecting their elderberries and elder flowers as well. So elderberry becomes a very important plant in Southern culture and pretty much everyone's culture as it started showing its face here in, in our region. So I have an elderberry syrup recipe that I have. Do a lot of you make elderberry syrup? Let's see some hands on that one. Um, this is one of my you know, favorite recipes. You can screenshot that if you would like to. I also love to tincture elderberry. That's probably one of the ways that I tend to use it more. And I go, you know, most tincturing is in vodka, like 100 proof vodka. But I really love to take the old school bourbon and whiskey of the ancestors and love, love to really have that. So you have like this hot toddy kind of thing. You could put it in your herbal teas that you're drinking that are geared towards that as well. So that's one of my, um, my little things that I like to check off. I love putting bourbon in there. I love adding some of the other antiviral herbs like lemon balm and nettles as well into mine. So adding some other plants to complement that. We're back to one of our favorites. I, one of you were saying like ground ivy is definitely the bane of your existence. <laughs> but now you'll learn to love her more. So it was also used for mild lung issues, coughs, bronchitis, um, also for arthritis and joint pain, which is one of the things that em, uh, Emma Dupree and Mary Hayden used it for as well. Um, we also talked about tinnitus. Stomach issues and diarrhea was one of the newest ones that I learned by talking to Mary Hayden's granddaughter, great-granddaughter. Um, we talked about earlier uh, with Mary Hayden. She actually was around during the Spanish flu epidemic. So one of the kitchen remedies that she used was onion cough syrup. Have any of you heard of that or any of your ancestors used that? I see a few of you saying yes. So she was able to treat the community with what she had. So she used a lot of the onions to make cough syrup and she had a huge survival rate, you know, in the community. They didn't lose a whole lot of people during that time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that one. Goldenrod, oh, it's one of my favorites. I love goldenrod. I love just to walk by fields of it come August. And now even here in the swamp, goldenrod shows up for me. And I really love that as well. It's used as a cold and flu preventative, also as an anti-inflammatory, antifungal, and an expectorant. So even adding goldenrod into your, um, into your elderberries are really great, especially for allergies. Somebody else in the chat was saying their parents used to use the onion cough syrup. I love that. That's all we got, honey. Mountain medicine. People got like chicken soup and all these sweet things. I'm like, uh-uh, you getting bold roots and some nastiness. It's my family as soon as you are sick. Um, goldenrod was also used for wounds, eczema, and rashes. So that can be like in an infused oil like a topical oil. A lot of us do um, infuse herbal oils uh, to make salves, um, to make any topical oil with that. So goldenrod would be used for that eczema anytime you got a rashes. Um, also another plant that I really love for rashes is chickweed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are seeing that come up right now, uh, chickweed. The beautiful thing about mother nature is at the turn of the season, she also gives us what we want. So the first plants we often see are the lymphatics. So like chickweed, cleavers, start seeing poke plants, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I, even in my back little courtyard area that I have here, I'm starting to see the cleavers and the chickweeds. So chickweed is another one that's good for, um, you know, rashes. It's also good for, you know, heat rashes. So like in the summertime, if you get heat rash or your clients do, that one's another great one. So this is goldenrod in the wild. Plants down through there. How 
many of you get to go foraging? Yay! Let's say, Omi, you are on it. You could be my plant sister. I was like, we need to come hang out. <laughs> the rest of you. So goldenrod. Let's get to the next one. Okay. Poke. Poke is one of the biggest plants that most people will scare you about in herbalist school. They're like, do not take the poke. If you take the poke, you're going to poison yourself. So being in the world of Black herbalism, a lot of us got together and poke is such an important plant in our traditions, especially moving into the South. When you're here in anywhere in the South and you talk to the elders about poke, they're going to call it poke salad with the tea. It's not poke salad, it's poke salad. And they don't even like, they don't even comprehend. I love talking to the elders about it. And I also found that a lot of men foragers, like this is one thing that a lot of men have carried on the tradition from their grandmother's grandmother's grandmother. So a lot of us got together and we were like, they've made us afraid of our own medicine and being apprehensive about this. So how can we reclaim even this plant? and herbalism and the important parts. So during the spring, poke salad, you know, the elders say it was to clean them out. Again, this is one of the first plants that come and like we're eating heavy foods, starchy foods through the winter. So what people would do in the South, they go out and forge the leaves. A lot of people say no higher than your knee is what the elders would say. And they would come and they would parboil it like two to three times. The old school Southern people, and I am not telling you to do this. Let's have a little, you know, preface that's there. But a lot of people would just parboil it once and then fry it up. And they wanted that, you know, um, you know, they wanted that, you know, puking, diary, you know, kind of thing. They wanted that just to kind of clean themselves out. So in my book, I have a recipe about parboiling three, sometimes four times to get the toxins off. So parboiling, so we boil the leaves, throw that water out, fill it up again, boil them, you know, throw that water out, fill it up again, boil it for that third time to remove the toxin from the plant. It lowers that and then sauteing it with, you know, our favorite things like garlic and onions and, you know, adding fire cider to it is one of my favorite things to also do as well. And eating that with other greens, I kind of couple it with collard greens sometimes. I've made a sog paneer with poke uh, greens as well using it with that one. So poke has become very much a fascinating plant. Uh, before we got started, Ryan and I were talking about um, meditating with plants. I don't know if any of you have tried that. They call it plant spirit meditation. So during COVID, it was very, this is just a funny personal story, is that I was out in the woods with this plant, talking to this plant, taking the tincture, and I was like, it was very interesting. I was like, show me your medicine. Honey, it was not even a month later. I went through a COVID divorce. Pope cleaned my whole life out. Like, <laughs> it cleaned everything out to really start this new adventure in my life. And at first, I was like, it all started with this poke meditation. So this is a very important uh, plant in African-American history because we're really all about you know, detox, not detoxing, because we all know that that word is a kind of a catch word. It's more of a niche popular word. But this plant is one of the first ones that come out with our cleavers and our chickweed to help boost the lymphatic system. And as the elders here say, clean you out. That's <laughs> kind of funny to me. So poke berries, they were actually used for infections, bites, eczema, lumps and cysts. Uh, poke root was also used. So you would gather the root. And if any of you've ever took a, taken on the adventure of gathering poke roots, they can end up like as big as a, uh, like a, a, you know, a 10 month old child. Like I spent one time, it was an hour and a half to two hours digging out a poke root. They get, you can get one good poke root. You'll be fine with poke for the rest of your life. 
And so the root, I feel like, makes a better salve than the pokeberries. So again, a lot of people would do it. Back then it was tallow. It was the fat of an animal is what they would make their salves out of. Modern day times were beeswax kind of, you know, combination with oils that's there. So that would be what you would use for lumps and cysts. I do also um, a lot of my breast cancer survivors, clients, you know, I do have a breast massage oil. Look, look at me, sorry. <laughs> I'm like a very animated person. So I couple poke root salve, you know, post, you know, treatment to kind of integrate into breast massage. So always doing their maintenance. Sometimes, you know, women or, you know, who are, have, whose family lineage has cancer, sometimes incorporating a poke oil or, you know, violet leaves also like the wild growing violets that's also a lymphatic as well so those are things that i like to really you know suggest to a lot of people who have that in their lineage who are also oh my god somebody's like as a kid and i play with poke berries my brother when he was young um i gave him poke berries <laughs> He was like, do you remember when you tried to kill me as a child? I was like, I felt like your lymphatic system was like really hurting. So see, that's your story. That's when you really became an herbalist as well. And like he was my first herbal client <laughs> when we were children. He really did need an exorcism. So this is the castor tree. It's very fascinating to watch castor oil being made. Um, I don't know how many, how old a lot of you are, but castor oil was taken as a laxative. It's like everybody was lined up in the South and like you got your dose of castor oil. We don't send, tend to use it that much anymore, but I am a very firm believer in castor oil stomach packs. I think those are very important. I love to use them. Even clients who have uh, uterine fibroids, I really have suggested to them to kind of bring this old school way back as well. People with stomach issues. Um, it's hard to find a good quality that you can actually internally take. In Haiti, when studying with the elders there, this is, they call it mascati. This is a pivotal thing. Nobody's household is going to be without castor oil. They use it for pain, they, any sore muscles, massaging with it. It is a staple in the household and Haitians do make the best castor oil I have ever experienced in my life. I had tried to figure out all the ways of bringing so much back. So again, uses an laxative, a detoxifier, immune booster for pain and swollen joints. So this one's a really good one because you know a lot of times if you're seeing like diabetics or you're seeing um, yes, the oil is made with the seeds. Well, not the seeds, they, yeah, they grow these little beans. Beans is a better word for that one. Castor oil for clogged milk duck. So that's really fascinating. I like that one. Just the massage with the castor oil. So it's made from the beans of the plant. And Haiti, they actually take the beans, fire roast them. And then in the mountains, they still use the little donkey that it, that runs around uh, the thing and like presses it but they also and they boil it they boil it and keep scooping it out so I love all these stories that you're sharing about castor oil and midwifery is definitely I think most midwifers have to have their little dose of castor oil was there so we know for a while it was actually on the banned list of plants, especially here in the South, because it could be poisonous. So there are still some plants that are listed on there. That's very strange to me that I guess we haven't taken the time to take them off. So it was one of the plants that they were very scared that enslaved people would poison the, uh, the people who had enslaved them. So they put that one on the band list. They're like, oh, you can't mess with that one. You might, because that was definitely one of the ways that we liberated ourselves was through the plants. We learned that that can also be very important, you know, liberator by poisoning people with the plants. And also the use of the plant cotton root. Cotton root was an abortive 
for enslaved women, they figured that out. And so that one was also banned. And if you were found using it, it was punishable by death or definitely lots of whippings, any of that. Like if you were found guilty, and we're seeing a lot of that right now with abortion laws and things as well. So cotton root was another one that was a banned uh, plant to be used. Pine. Pine is one of my favorites. Pine tea, uh, pine tonics is definitely used for colds, chest, sinus congestion, all the different immune, immune booster. The, the pine sap was used to pull splinters out. People would often put it on their fingers, cover it with something, and it would work to pull, pull it out. The sap was also used in salves to like heal wounds or cover over wounds. So you would like heat some up and melt it down that's there. I love making tonics with this. Um, I think it's really uh, one of the old timey remedies because it was so easily accessible. Pine was everywhere. So drinking your pine teas, also using the cones to extract out some of the medicine. They would tincture it as well with that one. So pine has become one of my favorites. And a lot of people also burning, like the inhalants, like burning um, pine, like the sap or the needles. Because so many people are into white sage, white sage. And I'm like, it's endangered. Stop burning sage so much. So collecting the needles and using the sap as um, a resin is really a beautiful thing. Pine also, it's magic. One of its magic, it helps heal intergenerational trauma. So the pine tree is not an accident. So that's why we have that, that smell. So even having a client, um, you know, that maybe has some family trauma, like adding a little bit of pine tea or pine medicine or even burning this pine would be very important. Somebody just mentioned turpentine. Turpentine was a huge medicine and the community, you would line up just like your castor oil shots. You would get your turpentine with your sugar cube and take a little shot of that. I was just gifted some old school turpentine. You know, people are a little apprehensive about using that old medicine, but it really works for parasites and worms. So I still use it as a remedy. Um, proceed with caution for that one, but definitely such a huge important part of Southern history. Another plant, passion flower. Have any, have many of you heard of passion flower? And as we all call them here in the South, may pop. So it's used for anxiety, uh, constipation, insomnia, lots of it in San Diego. Oh, wow, I love it. This is my first plant ally. So I, I call it my first plant. I would lay in the vines and pop the little pop things and smell them. So I really love this plant. It's one of my favorite ones just because it was around since I was a young little herbalist playing in the woods. So passion flower is really important right now for us in anxiety. I think post COVID, post those things, like we're really seeing, I know a lot of your friends, even yourself, a lot of anxiety that was used. This one was a big one Emma Dupree used a lot with her clients. Uh, people always talk about Emma. One of her biggest attributes is how she would listen to you. They're like, you could talk out a problem with her and you would just feel better leaving. So that's something that I tried to instill in so many of the students that I have, as well as myself as a practitioner, is just to be present. And so sometimes, you know, passion flower really helps us with our anxiety so we can be present with the person in front of us. You know, we walk in and somebody's like, I got a cold. You already have a list of five things that you're gonna do for them. And one of the most important things is, you know, seeing behind that, not just being like a prescription pad ready to, you know, do that. A lot of times in Chinese medicine, the lungs are associated with grief. And so grieving, so that's one part of the body that grief will hit. So it's like looking at your client, you're like, oh, you know, your mother just passed away or you just lost, you know, so-and-so, you know, 
it would be beautiful to couple, yes, treat the physical symptoms, but also look behind that and see and be very present. And that's one thing I really learned even more so studying Emma was the importance of her presence. Holy basil wasn't very much around as much in the South, but it's one of my favorite ones. They're actually doing research on tempered holy basil coming from Africa. So I'm really into this, like seeing what comes out. Um, most comes from India. Um, you know, and so there are different various kinds. So this is one of my favorite plants that I like to throw in. And also the concept of any of the basils are really important. Spiritually, these are often like basil is used in what's called a spiritual bath a lot. Spiritual bathing is using the plants for their, for lack of a better word, magic purposes, you know, throughout Africa and the Caribbean, spiritual bathing is often given to a client on top of the actual herbs. So you get the herbs to take, but they wanna treat the energetic body. So this is one plant that I really love to talk about when it comes to spiritual bathing. So we would take these plants, we would boil them into a tea and decoct it, and then have them pour it over their heads after it cools or in a bath, rubbing themselves with the plant to treat the spiritual, the mind and the spirit. We're treating the body with, you know, the prescriptions and the other things that you have, but we're treating the mind and the spirit with the energetic purposes of that. And that's also a good stress reliever, holy basil is. Tell me if you all use holy basil in the chat, and if so, what is your favorite variety? And we have milky oats that's there. Oats was a very big pivotal part um, of this, and milky oats is also used a lot in treating anxiety. I call it a nervo restorative. So it's like a warm sweater for the nervous system. So anybody who's gone through a lot of trauma, you know, that one's a really good one to take in tincture form, you know, tinctured at the milky face to help repair the nervous system. So that's one of my favorite ones for that. Ooh, tea with ginger. I'm going to have to make that. So we're going on into our granny's kitchen. Like I know uh, being from the South and raised on a farm, most of our medicine came from our kitchens. And I think this is the place that also as practitioners, we could really put you know, this healing aspect into the hands of our clients as well. Having some really good nourishing recipes. We talked earlier about Emma Dupree using onions for her onion cough syrup. You know, just think about it in our food. I use a lot of onions in my food because, you know, I'm always like traveling, teaching around people. So it's a very antiviral, good for colds, flus, congestions. A lot of them use onion poultices. Like in the South, it's really, and I still see this today. If like baby's got a fever, baby's got respiratory issues, Granny or auntie is going to come in there. They're going to cut some onion slices. They're going to put them on the bottoms of their feet. They're going to put socks on to pull that fever down. You know, uh, poultices for the chest, severe congestion. So we're going to put onions on the chest and we're going to put like some heat on there. Keep them all bundled up with their t-shirts on. So onions is a very pivotal part of healing because it was around everywhere. Fire cider is another one. Onions, horseradish, turmeric. That's like a, such a important uh, staple in folk medicine. I like to, as you can see in this picture, I add hibiscus into mine. So I think hibiscus is another added medicinal plant that I think is really beautiful in a fire cider. Um, I like to give people other options because I personally don't take a shot of fire cider. I make my uh, dressing, salad dressings with fire cider as vinaigrette. I make, um, I put it, when I cook greens, add it into my bone broth break because we got to add some vinegar into bone broth anyway. So I use it in those ways to kind of, because I cannot stand to take a shot of vinegar. It's just not, yep, soaking cucumbers in fire cider. I have a fire cider pickle recipe um, that I really love that I got super, I got completely jacked up about. So again, we see how adding these things like garlic and 
fire cider, bone broth, like having your clients make bone broth and then using it to make chicken soup or use it to make pho, you know, adding in the noodles, using it to cook their greens or beans in also. So there's different ways that we can really expand their way so they can incorporate it a lot more in their food. So onion cough syrup recipe that's here. This is one of my favorites. You can screenshot it. If you don't have the book, it's in there. So my grandmother was really simple. She was just slice some onions, pour enough water to cover them, and then add some sugar, white sugar. And so very simple, her recipe. So what I started doing was exploring other plants like sassafras, um, wild cherry bark, mullein, things like that to add into it. The cherry bark in here is really yummy. One of my clients uh, was like, you know, onion cough syrup tastes like dishwater. It's what's left over. I'm like, I don't get it, I guess, because I've drank it my entire life. So there are ways that we can, you know, definitely spice this up with the cinnamon, sassafras, and some other respiratory support herbs that's in there putting everything in a pot, letting it slow and low boil, and then straining that out and taking the tablespoons uh, a couple a day, one to two tablespoons, three to four times a day is one of my biggest ones. Um, I can drink this all the time. I definitely, it's preventative for me also. It's definitely been part of my regimen for the past two years. Definitely when I'm about to go speak a lot. So another one, collard greens. Um, how many of you love collards? So the liquor, <laughs> you're like, no. Try them with the fire cider and mixing them with other greens. One of the big things about collard greens is when you cook it, there's a Southern tradition, they call it pot liquor. That's the liquid that's created after cooking collard greens. It's nutrient dense immune, immune booster has so many vitamins, as you can see here, niacin, riboflavin, A, C, D, E, K, B6. It keeps going. Um, so potassium, magnesium, all of those things in there, just from drinking this nutrient-dense liquor that's here. I just saw somebody, I'm going to practice, they were doing a pot liquor fire cider. I was super excited. I know, it's <laughs> just like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, so that's definitely one of the things on my list to make. So collard greens are very much, they're very easy to grow. They're, they even sustain through the fall. This is what I put in my fall garden. So I have them for New Year's because we all know about the New Year's tradition. It doesn't matter where you come from, you eat your greens. Okra. Okra is such a pivotal, important plant to African-American history. Dishes in Africa come from, you know, okra. In Haiti, they call it kalalu. So a lot of their dishes have what they call kalalu in it, which is okra. One of my favorite plants. I love it for its mucilogenic properties. So it helps with constipation, gas, bloating, digestive issues. In the South, we love to fry it, which is not all the time great. So like, you know, I'll roast it or I do a lot of okra stews, which is one of my favorite ways to do it. I'm past the slimy parts of it. I really love okra. It's definitely rich in a lot of vitamins, calcium and zinc and definitely riboflavin, folic acid. So it's very much an important part. And this is one plant that we definitely knew, our ancestors knew, they brought it with them. I love it. And also as a spiritual additive about this plant, just a side story is a lot of healers that come from African descent use this as a spiritual bath. They will boil the pods in water and then use the bath, the water in their baths. And it's to clear all negative, you know, not all, it's to clear the negative energy in the body, stuck, stagnant energy in the body. And this was really funny. I was talking to one of the elders um, about this and using it for spiritual bathing. And she just looks at me. She's like, how did you hear about that? Because we're often a gatekeeper of our own information. And I was like, the plant told me. And they're like, oh, OK. She looked at me a little different, like I was a smarty pants. <laughs> All righty, we're at the hour. I want to take some questions. 
here's my contact information and ways to follow me. I'm about to do a virtual book club for the book. So it's going to get into even more about this um, in a workshop series to workshop when they're in this year. And so, yes, you can all look me up, Kimi, send me pictures of your food that you make. Anybody have any questions? Paris, you got your hand up or is that praise hands? Yeah, I have my hand up as well. Um, <laughs> I Yeah, I really wanted to say something before I go to class. I really, really appreciate the work that you just did. And I already bought the book while you were talking. I was on the Instagram page taking notes. And I find it so important because it's in a lot of cases, like I I learned so much about other holistic medicine history at, at the school and I never really hear our story. So I, I really appreciate you sharing the story. Um, oh, okay. You disappeared for a second. <laughs> okay. So I guess the question that I had for you, I had two and one was, um, do you have any recommendations for like what African-American healers can be doing in the future? Like anything that you want to see done more? Um, and then I also want to know if you had any resources for African-American healers to learn more, like if you're doing any type of work yourself or classes or authors, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I see. Let's grab, I have two books, Leah Penniman's Farming While Black. I have that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The book is coming out um, February 28th, so that mm -hmm. one's a great one. And do you have 400 Years of Working the Root by Michelle mm -hmm. Lee, I think is really important. Um, thank you all so much, everybody's leaving and everybody who can stay, I'm still here with you. Uh, I think one of the biggest important things that we as a community can do is talk to your ancestors, talk to your elders, really record more stories, spend some more time. I definitely will have some virtual classes that are happening and on my, my website's being reconstructed, but I want some more, you know, connecting a more herbalist in there. So if you also DM me on Instagram or send me um, an email, like, in the back of my book, I have a, the last chapter's living legacy. So I interviewed five herbalists that are important to me in Black herbalism and about their classes and about their connection. And so one of them is a, girl, a woman of Haitian descent. So she wrote one in Haitian Creole. Record your stories. Record your elder stories and really get into uh, being able to share those stories as well with other people. You know, we're, we're working very hard to reclaim our spaces back, both in the indigenous community and also mm -hmm. in the black community and really taking up more space. And I love seeing that. I want to see more black authors when it comes to herbalism, mm -hmm. healing arts. So it's very, you know, it's amazing for me. I was looking, I was at the Whitney plantation that's here doing land healing work at the Whitney and I was looking for a Zora Neale Hurston book and my book was there and I just like started crying, like being a part of this beautiful world of black herbalists, black authors and things like that. So go to your ancestors, go to your elders, ask your moms, grandmothers, all that, what they kind of plant medicine, record it, document it. Um, and you can also, there's lots of PDF files and things that are online. Unfortunately, a lot of our books are out of print now. So I'm like in the process of trying to see how what I can do with that. Thank you so much for that question, though. You have my email, so you can email me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Gabrielle? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been such a beautiful and lovely talk. And I so appreciate the work that you do. And I can't wait to get your book. Um, I, I think kind of continuing on Paris's suggestion, you know, I think something, um, that I really appreciate from our particular professor, um, we had to do a project about, um, historical formulations, right. And looking back and seeing how far back we could trace these formulations. And the one that I happen to choose, I trace back to the 1800s and the last um, written thing that I found about it was um, by this um, 
European man that was going into native tribes and working with the tribes. And he basically took information from them without attributing um, his work to them. And so from there on out, this formula got like passed on. And so my question to you is, you know, all of us are stewards of these plants and of this medicine and, and how can we be better stewards and do better work in researching um, some of the historical roots of this medicine that comes from all over the world that we use medicinally and otherwise. Um, how, what are your suggestions of, of how we could contribute to that work? I think it's important definitely cite the source because I found that in herbalism, like a lot of the famous white herbalists would be like, oh, I learned this amazing thing from a person of color or from an indigenous person, but they forgot their name. I was like, you remembered everything they told you, but you can't remember their name. So cite the source, honor the people that it comes from. When you take something, give something. It's important to me when I visit other cultures and they gift me with a story or gift me with a recipe that I do, like my earlier training was Eastern based. So I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, a lot of time studying with the women in the markets and like the people and the healers and the shamans and the things I saw. So part of my, you know, meta, my giving back, it's definitely you know, helping any way I can with that community. So honoring the source of which you have is definitely one of the most important things. And I really, really reiterate is sometimes you don't have to leave your own lineage. Like I find so many people who come from Celtic backgrounds or, you know, I am also, I come from multiple worlds. I have Scottish, Celtic, African, you know, all these different things. And I've woven that into this like patchwork quilt of some very powerful medicine. So sometimes you don't have to leave your own ancestry. And it's fascinating. I taught a food-based tradition class and one of the girls learned she loved to cook with dill and never talked about it, but she was from Sweden and dill is such a pivotal plant from Sweden. So she got really into studying her ancestry with plants. <laughs> So start at home, work your way around, but always, always cite the source. Benny. Hello, Lucretia. Uh, thank you again. Um, uh, my question is, um, so like I was really, um, I, I've had this plan on my mind since, you know, I, I read the, um, the, the autobiography of Frederick, Frederick Douglass. And I just wondered like if you had any experience working with it because I haven't actually worked with it, but, and, and if you have, you can talk on it, um, like whether spiritually or medicinally, the High John the Conqueror. Ooh, High John, we're talking about hoodoo root work. That's the, uh, hoodoo is uh, a spiritual form. And I write about that in my book because you can't talk about our plant medicine without talking about it. When you came from Africa, you have traditions of Ifa, and then you come from the Caribbean, you carry the traditions there. And then we come into the South where we had to adapt it into plain sight. So we had to hide our religions and our spiritual beliefs in plain sight. So High John the Conqueror was definitely, I know more about it spiritually than I do medicinally. Um, there are different stories about what High John comes from. Some people say, you know, this one, you know, we talked about earlier when she brought up somebody, you know, recording knowledge and going with the people and like, you know, learning this plant. They said, hi, John, they sent me, this person sent me this article. They had a song and everything. And I was like, this is wrong. I mean, a lot of people, unless you are really of the culture, they're going to give you fake information. It's just given. They're just like, oh, go over there until you really know what you're talking about and then come back. So High John the Conqueror is actually, um, it is the root of morning glory. So it's really fascinating. So sometimes, you know, and different people, I know then they didn't have access to something, they would use something else. So that's how we are, we move through that. But High John was used mostly in the world of working the roots. Like if you wanted something, you would carry High John on you. If you uh, wanted some money or there was a court case, Hi John would be on you. So um, I have some roots. I can't, I hate not having my apothecary right here. I'd be like, I'll show you. But medicinally, I'm still trying to retrace that back to the roots. But Hi John is definitely something that everybody would carry in their gree, -gree or like their little, 
you know, put it in their bra or put it in their pocket, you know, for good luck and for being able to maneuver situations to your benefit with that one. If I find out anymore, I will let you know. Send me your email with that one. But yeah. that's where typically the most information that you're going to find about High John is in root work. I'm about to start touring more through the South to like work with a lot of elders to see if I can find that one's on my list of digging a little deeper on. Is a, it just, a, lot, a, lot oh, sorry. This, a lot of this has to be dug up. Like you said, like it's, it's not, there's not a whole lot of uh, written history about the, you know, like the, the, the well, both the African American and the uh, Native sides. But like you said, the only history we get is by is by proxy, is, is by people who, yeah. are, you know, people that heard it or got this information from someone else, but they're not connected to the soul of it. They just got this information, like you said, they just took it and they don't they don't know the holistic value of the information that they have. Yeah, it's a very, and we're oral tradition because of that. Like our society and African American, you know, and in Africa, is you sit at the feet of your elders in all traditions. Like we don't do right by our elders in this culture. And I find that like you sit at the foot, you travel with the medicine person, you learn. It's been recently like we're trying to capture you know lightning bugs in a, in a jar by because we've broken that cycle of being with elders and medicine people so like you know it's even hard here in new orleans i came to do deeper research here in new orleans and sit with elders they'll send you on an adventure to go see what you know before they tell you what you know so you know it's that's the important part about like documenting researching, interviewing people and finding these old root workers and these old medicine makers so they can tell you a lot more about it. But we're an oral tradition. We wanted to keep the secrets. We wanted to, but now I'm like, it's getting time that we have to record the true secrets because it's a dying art form. Our elders, our ancestors are crossed over. So that's why it's important to me to go capture these stories of people and sit at the feet of the elders and yeah. you know, multiple times. Yeah. Well, either we need to capture it or more of us need to become griots and start telling them, but yeah. <laughs> I do, I get into a lot of heated debates sometimes about the things of that one. Jahara, is that how you pronounce your name? Jahari. Jahari. Peace and blessing, sister. I came a little late, but... Oh. Um, but I've really enjoyed you. So I, I heard you mention a book. Someone said that they bought your book. So I want information on that. And also uh, for two years, I went to uh, Black Mountain to the Wise Women's Herbal Conference. Yes. Were you there? Yes, I taught for several years. And I, I did thought the you looked familiar. <laughs> I, I thought you looked familiar. But anyway, so they have discontinued that. We need to do that. That that was so valuable. And it was such a love fest of it women. It was just so beautiful, so beautiful. And so I'm I, I'm just a novice, but but I'm learning from you and I've been learning over the years. And um, I just wanted to mention Dr. Jennifer Daniels work with the uh, turpentine. Yeah, the, the um, sap. Yeah, but I heard about it. I don't know how many decades ago, and then someone brought it up to me recently. I was like, "Oh yeah," so I do it every once in a while. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm getting ready to do the Florida Herbal Conference next month. So okay, I like that one. It's a co-ed event, so a different vibration. But um, okay. I'm blessed with like really meeting some amazing male teachers lately and it's very family so the florida herbal conference and then okay. the, the gullah geechee herbal conference is near charleston every october so that um, one's all, all people of color instructors very beautiful it's really awesome. so the gullah geechee herbal conference in october yeah yes. herbal conference and then i'm also doing the great lakes herb fair that's also in september so there's yes. some other ones that are happening and different okay. ideas and things that are churning that you can go. And by the way, right in, right above me, you can see my father. My father 
was at, you see Dr. and Mrs. King? Yeah. There, um, at the Selma March. He was a med medic at all of Dr. King's marches. He was the, the first black ophthalmologist in Maryland, but he uh -huh. was so attached to the allopathic way, but I'm the one that has broke. I'm a raw vegan chef I and, love herbalist, that. and somewhat herbalist because I help people with aphrodisiacs and pain relief, things like that through candies that yeah. are no, no sugar, because a lot of our remedies have so much sugar in them. And diabe oh. diabetes is just rampant. They even have type three diabetes now. I Did know, you hear that, about that? It's, I, it's that's a new one Dementia, dementia. Yeah. I was like, I always try to, you know, really invest in people and tell them like, where else can you put sweetness into your life? Because I find that a lot of people, especially type two, and now we have type three, are people who have forgotten themselves and don't know how to add that in. So I really, as a practitioner, try to look at that to wean them I off. I love it. I what love it. Sweet ceremony, self love ceremony. Can you do with this? And that's really helped a lot of people. They're like, oh, I'm just. Plus, we know sugar is like crack cocaine to the brain. Like the brain right. is oxygen and then sugar. So it's a really hard, like we should almost treat it like yes. a 12 week program. So it's really important yes. to find the alternatives and to wean people off. It's not fun. And if you quit sugar and caffeine at the same time, oh my gosh, you're going to drink passion flower tincture like crazy. Miss oh. Naomi. <laughs> Thank you. I love you. I'm, I've got to get your book. Where can I get the information? It's uh, African. If you Google my name, Lucretia Van Dyke, it shows up. And then it's okay. African American Herbalism, a practical okay. guide to healing some folk traditions. But if you Google me, it comes up everywhere. It's kind of crazy. Thank you so Nail. much, sister. All right. You're Peace welcome. and blessings. Namaste. <laughs> Hey there, um, Lucretia, you have got me so excited. That was a good talk. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, a few things, I'm an Appalachian American myself. And so just listening to um, all these remedies is just bringing me right down memory lane. And, and so thank you for, for stoking those fires. Um, I, I am a graduate of this program. Um, I graduated five years ago in uh, midwifery. And now um, Emily Jenkins and I, we actually teach the botanical medicine for midwifery um, uh, classes. And I would beg you to come be a guest speaker um, at our classes. Um, we have, uh, it, because I, I had the pleasure of going through the classes and now I'm teaching them, there's this huge um, lens of uh, Eurocentricism on everything herbalist is how I feel about it anyways. Um, and uh, a lot of our students um, are calling us out on it. Thank God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I have been reaching out to black herbalists with very little success and asking them to come, um, to come not only teach our students, but teach me and Mila as well, right? Like we have a lot to learn. So um, I don't know what your life looks like, but I would love to connect with you after this. And, and, um, and yeah. and have you, yes, yep. You have my email address, so you can email me definitely through there. And then I have some reading resources I can suggest to you. Um, this one what? new book. We have your book on our required reading list. Yeah, and this new one is really great. Um, it's Linda Villarosa, Under the Skin. She writes a lot about uh, Black people in the medical field. And, mm -hmm. and, and like, she's very, I got to meet her. She's really brilliant about talking about medicine, especially like with the statistics, especially being in a first world country how many black females, you know, die in labor. So I think it's really important to have, you know, that perspective just for your own to get a more understanding of that as well. But yes, um, you'll have the recording here. You have my email, please email me. Uh, and there's also the Black Doula Association that's out of Atlanta. So they're a very good resource. They have a lot of really amazing, um, you know, they've been interviewing 
old midwives, you know, uh, some of which we're losing women who've been in it for 40, 50 years. And so they have some good resources as well. But reach out to me. Definitely. Well, can you tell me the name, uh, the 400 years of working? And I didn't hear working the last the part. Roots. It's called Working the Roots okay. by Michelle, my friend, Michelle Lee. Great. Thank you. I'll be in and, touch. Yeah. And like, there's some, um, you know, other, there's a beautiful documentary. If you remind me to, uh, I'll send you a link to that okay. as well. Do we have one more question? Are we good? Um, I just want to say something really quick. Um, yeah. Being a black woman from Charlotte, um, I also went to Western Carolina, so I frequented Asheville. Um, and then my grandparents have a farm, so I spent my years gardening with them and whatnot. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story um, because it really resonates with me and helps um, remind me of why I'm doing this. Yeah. My why is always reiterated by this. It's been very interesting, especially even on this book signing thing. Like my first place, you know, that I signed was on an old plantation. And like, I go and like, you know, I have this connection to the land so much that I do these healing rituals to honor the ancestors before us. But it was very interesting to stand in front of all these people teaching our medicine and seeing my own people smiling and nodding and doing praise hands and like remembering and it's in our bone marrow and it's you know it, it's so important to like keep those stories if your grandparents are still with you ask them call them record them film them um all of those things are very important can you still hear me okay good somebody's like my audio cut up uh, so yeah, keep it, being a keeper of the stories and remembering, because even coming into the world of herbalism, into the world, people even look at us differently. Like we don't know as much as other people. I learned very early that I have to learn five times as much, three times faster. So I was kind of like an OCD. And then I was like, okay, now let's just sit with the plant. So let's just sit with them and know them. And anybody can be an herbalist for real. Like, I think you need to know 10 plants forwards and backwards. You don't have to, in North Carolina, we have 4,500 species of plants. Will I ever learn them all? No, I won't. And that's the exciting part about it also, is that it keeps me passionate about learning. And so I just, you know, I'm like, learn those 10 plants. That's why I asked you about your first plant ally and the ones you use, know how to use them frontwards, backwards, tincture, tea, food, all of those things and keep up with it. You know, I don't think it's difficult. I definitely, I have a different um, form. I, I've studied plants with shamans and people who don't exist anymore. So I don't have your stereotypical, you know, thing. I can flex that way if I want to, but the most important medicine I've learned is in the markets in these places with the old medicine people. So I don't think it's, you know, I try not to let it limit me because I know what my tradition with the plants is. I love it. You all have been so wonderful. Good luck in your world. I hope this has helped you see a different perspective and to look at people in a holistic way, honoring their mind, their body, their spirit, understanding how the plants can be there for you in all the different ways you know, through ceremony, through spiritual bathing and your food that you eat and the medicine that you prescribe to other people and how many beautiful lives that you're gonna touch and honoring the spaces and honoring the stories of people um, is really important. Just to take in a moment to look at someone else's perspective through the plants is really a humbling experience if you allow it to be, but an expansive experience for sure. We don't have any more questions. Thank you oh, yeah. so much again, Lucretia. It's been such a joy to host you in this talk today. I love it. I'll come back anytime and hang out with all of you. And if you're I'm ever so in New Orleans, look me up. <laughs> I actually did have a question. I have to use my yeah. phone, so I wasn't able to like push the buttons okay. fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what, um, your thoughts are or do you use I guess fungi as well because I know we um vibe a lot around the plant kingdom as we should and so I'm wondering what about the fungi 
mycelium is going to change the world. I have just did, um, they have one, it's out, is it Wisconsin? I think the Mycelium and Mysteries um, Conference, it's all mycelium. And so I was a, a speaker and a ceremonialist there. I use a lot of mushrooms at, and I, I love to powder them down and put them in. Um, I make my own spices. So I've been really into like taking all the different like turkey tail, all of those, powdering them down, adding them with Vitex, which is really beautiful because I'm working on, I'm perimenopausal. So I'm working on like a lot of hormonal chucking and jiving there for real. <laughs> so uh, reishi is a daily staple of mine and has been for years. I mean, I can't say, I say so much about reishi. Spiritually, it really helps you align with your sacred purpose. So if you're really in that, I don't know what I'm doing phase, reishi is one of the first ones. Also helps with dreams. So it helps you recall dreams, because as I have pointed out to you, as, as some of the black healers that we talked about today learn things in their dream world. So I'm a huge component of mushroom medicine and all aspects of her. We're also seeing lots of exciting evidence on microdosing psilocybin, which I think is completely fascinating. Uh, for depression, for like helping rewire the brain, which is so important. So I'm very excited about that being, you know, on the table to discuss as well. Mushrooms are so, how they connect us and how they grow is so important. So I have, you know, my mushroom blends that I'm every day, all day. And I try to figure out how to cook them and eat them and saute them and rehydrate them and powder them down all the time. So mycelium is really a huge part of my practice as well. And I encourage you all to really look into medicinal mushrooms and always, and it's interesting to forage for them. I'm not quite there yet with other people. I'm like, I can spot reishi and like, you know, and um, chicken of the hen of the woods and those kind, but like I'm still like trying to be on it with like a forager for mushrooms. But yeah, I definitely think that, especially all of you who are, you know, graduating, graduated, definitely we're going to see a lot more of mushroom talk in the future. And I think it's really pivotal to add that to your research to understand um, how you can integrate that into your clients. Uh, diets as much as possible, either through teas, tinctures, or I, you know, I even had the dehydrate them that I rehydrate them and I put them in my bone broth as well. So I'm really like mushroom, my dried shiitakes and chicken of the woods and reishis are always in my bone broth and any slow cooked soups that I do. Um, also, I love the mushroom world. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really um, appreciate your talk and just your presence and everything. I, my parents for religious reasons basically were like, we're going to abandon all ethnicity, race, ancestry, culture. So I grew up, um, in, intentionally and decidedly removed from it. And it's been a tough process of trying to reconnect with that. Cause you know, you can try to leave the ancestors behind, but they'll, they won't leave you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, reach out and grab that hand again so i this has yeah. been um really informative but honestly really um comforting and validating so thank you so much for holding yeah. that presence i think the plant world is the beautiful and the food traditions is the beautiful way to segue um not to i told y'all i was wordy so <laughs> um i grew up in the white side of my family and because i'm in the racist south so the plant world is really what pulled me back those ancestors were really talking to me very deep and heavy and pushing me to go into these spaces so, and I, I tell people that all the time, people pay a lot of money and make ancestor work so hard. I'm like, you can't get any closer to your people. They're literally in your bone marrow. So like spend the time asking those for your highest and greatest good to come and teach you, to hold you, to lead you to the next teacher, to be the next thing and walk unapologetically in that. You know, it's definitely different when you go back home to your family, but I don't try to preach to people I am the example and people ask me questions so I'm like you know if I'm good I'm on my own healing 
you know, I'm going to teach you what you need to, if you ask me. I used to, I'd just be like, almost like the Black Panther movement, you know, it's like, it was really into but uh, now I just, you know, I follow the rituals and the plants have really, really been that family that I feel like I missed out on and that cultural connection that I really feel like that's what's helped me is by studying our own medicine and reconnecting to the past. Good luck. All right, y'all have fun for those who are cooking my recipes. I don't know which one you're cooking. Do you get to choose one? We're going to do um, the onion cough syrup and one week, and then a second week we're going to do your self-love sugar scrub. Oh, I love it. And we didn't even get a chance to talk about body products. I'm like, that's a whole like, I'm like, it's your spiritual bath on a go. That's why I really create those. And I love medicinal. I could teach a full class on just medicinal infused oils. I'm like, that we would is love like, to bring you back for that. <laughs> Oh my God, it's my favorite. I'm like, and I love to, I, when I teach those, uh, I didn't realize skincare is a, a ceremony and a ritual until I went to Southeast Asia. And I realized that their skincare wasn't just this, like put this on your face. It was really a ceremonial thing. And so breaking down these recipes and seeing those things and how we love ourselves and how we can, and, and, and teaching that to your clients also, like the vibration of the plant medicine is in that. So you're rubbing yourself with it. You're giving these meditative moments to your clients and yourself. So it's really important. Yeah, I'm a skincare, <laughs> especially plants and skincare. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Very excited. Right. Both the rest of have a good day. I'm about to go eat some beignets. Well, thank you again so much. You enjoy the rest of your day as well. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended today's talk. Thank you all so much. We'll see you again, hopefully soon. Yes. <laughs> thank you.